Welcome to the Level Up English podcast, the best place to come to practice the English language, learn about the British accent and culture. With me, your host, Michael Lavers. Hello, English learners. Welcome back to the podcast. Michael here, and I am recording this intro for the second time because I really messed up the first time. <laughs> But I hope you're having a good week. Today, I've got a topic all about driving. This was a listener request, and I thought it was a really good idea. So, I'm going to be talking today about driving and cars and taking your driving test as well. So, I'm going to be talking a little bit about my experience with driving and going through some hopefully useful vocabulary because there are so many words that. You have to you have to learn basically, and another change that some of you might have noticed is this podcast is also on YouTube. So before until now, I only put the conversations on YouTube. So that was one podcast a month on YouTube. From now on, I'm going to try to put every podcast on YouTube. Maybe I'll stop in the future. I don't know. It depends if people like it, but. My plan now is to record the audio and the video version. So that means whatever you prefer, you can you know consume the podcast in that way. The microphone may be slightly worse than before, so you have to let me know if you think the quality has got worse. Let me know, and I'll I'll see what I can do. But hopefully, this is still a good quality episode to listen to, even if you don't use the video. But yeah, so the YouTube channel, if you're listening on the podcast, is the Level Up English podcast. So you can type that in on YouTube, and you can see my face if you want to, for whatever reason. I don't know why you would want to, but you can you can come here and hang out with me if you prefer. <laughs>、um, and I will be looking at my notes I've got on the side here because I've got lots of good driving vocabulary today. And as always, I would. Well, I've got some big news actually for my membership, Level Up English membership. So, as always, you can go to the membership to access the podcast transcripts. I spend so much time making the subtitles for every episode, so I'm pretty sure that's going to help you if you want to catch everything that me and my guests are saying. I think that should help you. In addition to that, I've got online courses like for the IELTS exam. I've got a weekly writing challenge to help improve your writing, and people seem to be really enjoying that. I've got some good reviews on the writing challenge, and the big news is I'm starting group lessons in February. So I mentioned this a little bit on a previous episode and on YouTube, but my goal for Level up English is to do group classes every week. At the moment, they're doing every two weeks, but in the future, I would like to do them every week. Every Sunday, we're going to do a group class. It's going to be a conversation with me and a small group of you guys. We're going to be practicing vocabulary on a specific topic, sharing opinions, asking questions, all that kind of stuff. There's no extra cost if you're a member. It's completely free and included. So I really hope this can take off, and we can, you know, build up this group class community. That'd be very exciting. I mean, if you have any questions about it, just let me know. But this is at levelupenglish.school. The members button at the top is where you have to go to find these group classes. Okay, that is my little shout out to what I'm doing over there for today. Now let's get into the topic. So, driving, yeah, driving. I've been driving for ten、uh, years now, but it's been kind of on and off driving. I haven't, I don't have a car now, and I haven't had a car for some years. But I have known how to drive for ten years, so I'm a fairly confident driver. But I do consider it to be quite dangerous. You know, when you get into that car, you are increasing. Your chance of having an accident, right? It's much more dangerous than going on the train, isn't it? So I don't know. I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but I, I try to think about what I'm doing in that way, and I 
I don't know. I, I just prefer trains. I'm just trying to justify why I prefer trains, I suppose. <laughs> when I did my driving test all those years ago, the first thing that you have to do is answer a question related to the car. If I remember correctly, it's something like, for example, if I want to check the oil in the car, how would I do that? And then you go with your instructor to the front of the car. In American English, they would call it the hood of the car, the hood, right? In British English, we call it the bonnet, the bonnet. It's the front part of the car, usually the part that has the engine under, right? And that's a tricky thing about car vocabulary is most of the words for cars are different in American and British English. So we can talk about them in a little bit as well. But yeah, he asked me like, you know, where do I check the oil? Where do you check the oil? So I lifted the bonnet, I got the little stick thingy and I checked the oil and he was like, yep, that's okay. So he might ask you to like replace the windshield fluid to clean the windows. Windshield, by the way, is that big window at the front of the car. It's a windshield. Little things like that. Another important word for cars is the boot, the boot. Just like your shoes, it's the same word, but it's a different meaning. So in British English, the boot is the storage part of the car, right, where you keep things. I never really used the boot. I don't know, maybe for shopping. I never really use it. I don't know. I just use the seat. <laughs> in American English, this is called the trunk. What's quite funny is both of these are, what would you say, Homo homonyms, right, homonyms. It shares a the spelling and the, the sound with another word, but the meaning is different, right? So boot that you wear and boot of a car, trunk of the car, as Americans would say, or trunk as in the elephant's trunk. So yeah, English is confusing, isn't it? So yeah, they say trunk, we say boot. Another common difference is what Americans would call blinkers. Blinkers, the flashing lights that tell you whether you're going left or right, we would call indicators, indicators, because they indicate what direction you're going to turn. It's an indication of where you're going to go. But I guess American English tends to simplify things a little bit. Blinker, maybe it's easier to remember, perhaps. But yeah, those are some important words for the car, and you might have to check that in your driving test. And when it comes to the test, another thing that we did in the UK, I say did because it might have changed. This was again 10 years ago. I'm getting old, perhaps. <laughs> but when I did it, there was a theory test and a practical test. The theory test is the one where you sit down at the computer and you have to answer questions about the rules of driving, the rules of the road. And it's a little bit boring and tedious, but I don't think it's too difficult if, you, if you've done some research and preparation. And one part of the test that I did anyway was called the hazard perception, hazard perception test. And I'm sure it's improved. It must have improved in the last decade. But when I did it, it was like a video of someone driving down the road. And whenever there was a hazard, you had to click the video to, yeah, just to say there's going to be a potential problem here. It could be a problem. A hazard is another word for a danger, potential danger. So for example, as the car was driving down the road, another car would pull up onto a side road. You would click the screen in order to indicate that there's a hazard here. And the faster you clicked, the better your hazard perception. If you were really, really slow or you missed the hazard, you got a bad score. I don't think it's a very good way of measuring because it's, it's very different clicking on a computer compared to driving in real life. But that's one thing we had to do. And there are so many things to look out for. It was quite, quite confusing, really, like having all these people running onto the road and stuff like that. But I, I wonder if it's the same these days. But yeah, you can let me know if you like how the driving test was where you live or how it is. Do you think it's quite easy? Is it good enough? Is it very difficult? I know different countries 
vary greatly in the difficulty of the test, don't they? So when you're driving, this is a whole nother area, a whole nother ball game, we can say, which is a good expression for like a whole nother area of things to talk about. And there's so much to keep in mind and pay attention to. You can feel a bit like an octopus with all these things happening simultaneously. And a lot of it will come naturally. I guess I'm saying this to new learners, right? If you're a new driver, you're not sure how you're going to do it. A lot of it is natural. Like when you're walking, you don't have to think about how to walk. It's similar with driving. After some weeks of practice, it will become more natural. And then people say the car feels like an extension of your body. The car is moving, but you don't really feel separate from the car. You feel connected to the car. It's a really strange feeling and it's quite exciting. I guess that's why people like driving. In the UK, we have lots of difficult, let's say hazards again, when driving. Very, very different from other countries, especially America, for example. In America, they have many intersections where the roads come together and they intersect, right? In England, we call these junctions. So another different word here, junction. So again, a junction is just when one road comes to meet another road and one you know, line of traffic on the road will always have priority. If you have priority, that means by law, you are allowed to go and the other road has to stop and wait for you until they can go, right? Roundabouts are a tricky thing, right? We have so many roundabouts in the UK and anyone visiting the UK or taking their test here might complain about them. Like, oh, I hate roundabouts, they're so confusing. You've got big ones and small ones, which we call mini roundabouts. It's very confusing. It looks quite daunting. Daunting means scary and you know, you're not sure. Yeah, just a little bit nervous about it if it's daunting. I've heard though studies that roundabouts significantly decrease the number of road accidents. Because I see a lot of videos like in America, they've got these big intersections that cross you know, in an X shape or a plus shape. And cars go so fast through them because maybe they didn't see the, the red light and they didn't slow down and then cars will collide at really, really fast impacts and or fast speeds or impact at a fast speed is what I meant to say. Roundabouts on the other hand, people will always slow down. Well, that's, that's the idea. They slow down. People on the roundabout always have priority. And in the UK, you have to give way to your right. Give way is a really, really useful phrasal verb for driving. So if you give way, that's basically you let the other car go first. You give them the right of way to go. So if you're coming to the roundabout and there's a car also on the roundabout on the right side, you will wait for him or her. <laughs> I'm thinking cars are boys, right? I don't know why. You'll wait for that car to go round. If there's a car on the left side, that car should wait for you to go round because you're on their right. Right? <laughs> it becomes a lot easier once you're in the road, but I think looking at it from above makes it more confusing sometimes. Some of the vocabulary, I suppose, we've got like pavements or paths. Americans will call the sidewalk, which makes sense. We usually call it a pavement or path. Uh, when you want to stop driving, that's very important. You probably want to find a car park, a car park. <laughs> when I was a baby, I used to call it a park park because I couldn't pronounce it. <laughs> but car park, right? So you find a car park to park your car, makes sense. Americans will call this a parking lot, parking lot. So yeah, another difference there. But yeah, I've got lots more vocabulary here. So let's talk here about the term road rage. This is a good expression. Rage means anger. So road rage is an expression meaning the anger you get when you're driving on the road. And I find this so interesting because 
people seem to turn into totally different people when they're on the road. And I notice this in myself as well. When I'm driving, I notice this feeling of impatience coming up with inside me, more so than if I had been walking or on public transport. And I believe one reason for this is simply because it's difficult to feel compassion for these big metal machines, these big metal cars, right? If I could look you in the eyes, it would be much harder to be mad at you. So people really experience road rage, they're beeping their horns, there's a good expression to beep your horn, beep beep beep. I'm um, getting very mad at other people on the road. I can hear it all the time because I'm next to a main road where I live now and people get so angry, it's, it's really terrible. My outlook on this, I like to try to think of this almost like a form of meditation or mindfulness where I'm driving and I'm being really aware of my thoughts. If any anger starts to arise in me, I try to become aware of this and question it. Like, hmm, why am I angry? What's going on now? What's going on right now? You know, I'm not always perfect at that, but I think it's quite a fun way to look at it. It, it turns it into more of a game, more of a playful thing rather than taking it so seriously. But my biggest advice to anyone who is driving and gets road rage is imagine the person you're mad at in another vehicle is your grandma or something like that. Because we always imagine maybe it's just like this big muscular man or this like annoying guy. I mean, I do anyway. When I think of someone driving badly, I imagine it's just like a middle-aged man who is really has an annoying face, you know, <laughs> maybe like me. But if I imagine it's my grandma driving and you know, she's old, she's not a very confident driver, I have much more sympathy. Ah, oh, okay, I'll be patient. I don't want to scare my grandma. And, and the fact is it could be someone's grandma. It could be your grandma, you know? So <laughs> I think that really helps curb drive, drive, road rage. It helps curb road rage. Now that I've mentioned that word curb, this is a good one. To curb as a verb means to control something in some way. The government is trying to curb the use of alcohol. They're trying to reduce and control the alcohol consumption. In driving, it's a noun spelt differently. It's spelt differently. So I, I put this in my notes on the show notes page. And this refers to the edge of the pavement, the edge of the path or sidewalk that connects the road, connects to the road. So for example, in your driving test in England, if your wheel hits the curb and goes up onto the path, you automatically fail your test. That's how it was when I did it anyway. So you never drive on the path. It's always a failure of the test and usually it's illegal as well. That's why you fail. Okay, another good term, which maybe you guys can guess, is backseat driving. Are you a backseat driver? This doesn't mean you're steering from the backseat, but it means a passenger that you have behind you who's telling you how to drive. So it's like they're driving. They're so involved in your driving that they're doing it for you. I guess we also have other terms like backseat gaming, I've heard as well, when like someone's telling you how to play a game, even though they're not playing. And it's really annoying, isn't it? It's like, Oh, stop backseat driving. I know how to drive. Stop telling me what to do. It's quite annoying. So that is what we call backseat driving. I used to really hate that when I just passed my test. That was very annoying. Mm, a few more words I could talk about here. Maybe I can make it into like a nice story. Okay, make it into a story. So when I do drive, it's usually in Cornwall lots of country lanes, not many like big motorway, well actually no motorways in Cornwall, only what we call dual carriageways, which is, you know, Americans don't have that word, they might call it like a highway or something like that. A dual carriageway, dual means two, so that means there are two lanes of different traffic and two lanes going each way, or two, at least two, right? So two lanes going this way, two lanes going the, the oncoming way. 
And we have some of these in Cornwall, but not motorways. Motorways are much bigger, where you have three lanes, perhaps. Um, I think, I think that's right anyway. And when I'm driving in Cornwall on these country lanes, I have to be very careful when I accelerate. Accelerate, or the accelerator, is what British would call the gas pedal. Gas pedal is American. In England, we say accelerator. So you accelerate to make the car go faster. You have to be very quick on the brake. You know, the brake is the pedal that stops the car. So you have to be very quick to stop because you go around these windy, narrow country lanes and it's very hard to see. So there might be a big tractor coming the other way and you have to stop the car or pull over to the side. And yeah, if you're going too fast, you will crash. So be very careful on these narrow country lanes. The other pedal that you will have if you drive a manual car, not an automatic car, is the clutch pedal. I believe on the, on the left, right, the clutch pedal is the one you have to hold down uh, when you're starting the car or changing gear to accelerate. Don't make me explain the clutch anymore, I'm not that good with cars, but... <laughs> Clutch is that pedal that uh, you push down to change the gears, basically. One final thing I should say is pedal. Why do we call it a pedal? These pedals, they're called pedals because you use your feet to push them down. The word ped, P-E-D, means feet, foot. And there's many other cases where you'll see this, like uh, P... What's a good example? I totally forgot. What's it called? Um, pedicure. That's what I'm thinking of. Pedicure. Pedicure is when like you will get your toenails painted and your feet. I don't know. I don't, I've never had one, but pedicure. Yeah. Girls will know what that is, right? <laughs> Another word related to driving is pedestrian. Pedestrian is a person who walks on their feet, right? So as opposed to someone who's driving, it's someone who's walking. So the number one thing to remember in England is pedestrians have right of way. You should give way to pedestrians. So if, if, if a pedestrian, a person, is crossing the road, you have to wait for them. Yeah, you have no right to beep your horn or get mad at them because you can kill them, but they cannot kill you in your big car, right? So that's the idea. Pedestrians have right of way. Always be patient with them. And I'm saying that as a pedestrian because I don't like it when people get mad at me. <laughs> I think I'll leave it here for the car vocabulary. I've spoken a long time already and I haven't got through even like 20% of my list. But maybe that could be room for a part two one day. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed that. If you are driving or you're taking your driving test in the future, let me know. Let me know if you learned anything new today and if anything you find difficult, if there's any area specifically related to English that you find challenging. But yeah, um, a reminder, by the way, at the end here, we'll I'll say a quick thank you to a couple of you, then we'll look at a quote from Instagram to, to sign off. But I also want to remind you about my private podcast. I forgot to mention that. So on my private podcast, this is also available to Level Up English members. I've recently done an episode on conditionals where I was talking about like, if I could, I would, blah, 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 blah. So I think that would be a fun episode. I also have a little bonus one on the 16th of February where I was speaking with Rod, the English teacher, where we were talking about British culture and Brazilian culture and the differences between them. So yeah, I hope you like it. It's a very small audience on that podcast and I feel like I'm a lot more relaxed. I can talk about more personal things. So it's a nice environment. But yeah, let's have a quick look at the reviews. I've got so many reviews recently and I'm really grateful to all of you. So thank you for leaving them. I have one from Madame Mirvan who says, Hi Michael, thank you for all of this. I am in Oxford to improve my English and always listen to your podcasts. I learn a lot from you. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. I've never been to Oxford, but I would love to visit. 
some point soon, maybe this year. One from Jordan, the country, and someone called Batulamad1 says, I love your podcast, you are the best, and listening to you from Jordan. Thank you very much. Let's do another one from Yemen. This one's from Yemen, and it's Amar Aldo Bais, who says, Hi guys, thank you so much for this great podcast. Greetings from Yemen. And one final one from Ashash, Ash, 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 Aisha, perhaps, <laughs> who says, can you do some short stories about books you read and want people to read? Good request. Maybe I'll do that. I could talk about books I read. I don't know if they'll be that interesting for other people. And you know, I don't really read many books interesting for English learners, perhaps, but I could consider doing that. I'm reading a lot more at the moment, so I could consider that. But yeah, thank you very much for leaving those reviews. It means so much to me. The five star reviews really help because it, it pushes me higher on the rankings and more people will find out about me. But yeah, thank you for doing that. And let's end today with a quote from Instagram. So I leave these quotes every Friday on my Instagram page and I like to read them here because hopefully it's inspirational. And yeah, this one, I might have said it before, I, I tend to lose track, but it doesn't matter, it's inspirational, I hope. From William Crawford, who says, being a student is easy, learning requires actual work. Student easy, learning work. Have a think about that. But for now, I will leave you there. So thank you very much for watching or listening and I'll see you in the next episode. Goodbye for now. You have been listening to the Level Up English podcast. If you would like to leave a question to be answered on a future episode, then please go to levelupenglish.school forward slash podcast. That's levelupenglish.school slash podcast. And I'll answer your question on a future episode. Thanks for listening.